Good evening and welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at the Payton Fork Chapel Christian Church on Sermons by Dale Dungeon. I hope you're having a good day. Tonight we're going to continue in our study of Paul's journey from Jerusalem to Rome. And tonight we pick up with an account of Paul appearing before King Agrippa. Now in the story, uh, we see Agrippa enter the scene here in our last chapter, which we finished off last week, which was chapter 25. And Festus, being a Roman governor, was interested in having Paul appear before Agrippa so that he could get Agrippa's point of view and input so that he might be able to write specific charges against Paul as Paul had appealed to Caesar. And as he concluded, uh, chapter 25, uh, Festus had this to say, the end of chapter 25 and verse 27, for I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. So Festus was interested in having Agrippa's input in order to have uh, specific charges to accompany Paul as he journeys uh, to Rome to appeal before Caesar. Tonight we're going to pick up with uh, chapter 26, beginning with verse 1. And we're going to read uh, from verse 1 uh, down to verse 11. And again, I'll be reading from the New International Version. Acts chapter 26, beginning with verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews. And especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you, listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have lived since I was a child, from the beginning of my own life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I live as a Pharisee. And now, it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise of our twelve, this is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night, O King. It is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that it is uh, just, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison, and they were put to death. I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So Paul begins here by talking about uh, the nature of the accusations and his history in Judaism and his past. Let's begin there with a word of prayer. Great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the opportunity we have tonight to study it. Father, we pray that we might uh, speak with boldness and clarity. Father, I pray that we might always speak the truth. And uh, Lord, help us to testify about what Jesus has done in our lives, just as Paul did so many years ago. Father, we thank you for the life-changing power of Jesus. We thank you for the testimony of men like Paul. And uh, Father, we each, each one of us, it's our hope and prayer that we might be faithful and might hold on to that profession of faith, uh, even to the hour of our death. And Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus, and it's in his most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Now, last week, as we were in our study, as we introduced King Agrippa into this situation, I mentioned that Bernice was his wife, and that's not true. 
uh, Bernice uh, was Agrippa's sister. As uh, they come into the picture in Acts chapter 25, verse 13, uh, we can see a little bit about Agrippa. Agrippa was the great-grandson of Herod the Great, and that was the Herod that was king of Judea when Jesus was born. They called him Herod the Great. Uh, of course, we don't think of him as being very great because he ordered the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem, and he was really a, a bloodthirsty character who was only interested in power. But, of course, in the pre-Christian ancient world, <laughs> Those are the kind of things that counted for greatness. So he was the great-grandson of Herod the Great, and uh, he was Drusilla's brother. And on his father's awful death, uh, he was successor. Now we know that his father died. We read about that in Acts chapter 12, uh, verse 23, that um, Herod makes a speech. Well, if we pick up in Acts chapter 12, verse 20, uh, we can read the story of his death there. Acts 12, 20 says this, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, and they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, uh, the king's chamberlain, their friend desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, apparel rather, sat on his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem uh, when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now there we read of Agrippa's father's death, who was another Herod. And uh, this Herod was the Herod that had uh, James beheaded. Uh, he had James killed. And what happened uh, to him later we read about, we read about uh, J uh, James' death in the beginning of... Um, the book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now at about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church and killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, uh, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Uh, then, then, uh, then were the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him into prison and delivered him uh, to four quaternions of soldiers to keep in, him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Therefore, Peter was kept in prison, uh, but with prayer uh, was made without ceasing by the church uh, for him. Uh, so they were praying for Peter. And of course, as we know, what happens after their prayer that the Lord uh, miraculously saved Peter from prison. In Acts chapter 12, verse 7, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and the light shined in the prison. He smote Peter on the side, raised him up, saying, Arise, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast about thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came to the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and passed through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectations of the people of the Jews. When he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the brother of John, whose surname was Mark, uh, where many were gathered together praying. And of course, as we know the end of the story, Peter knocks on the door. The young lady goes to answer the door. Her name's Rhoda. But uh, she didn't open the gate, and uh, she recognized his Peter, Peter's voice, but she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told them. And of course, their first inclination was it's an angel. As it says at the end of verse 13, uh, 15, and they, they said it, 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 his, his angel, his ghost, he's dead, and it's his ghost. 
Peter continued knocking, and finally they opened the door, and they were astonished. God had answered their prayers. He went to where they were, and they were praying for Peter. Now, James had died. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. He was martyred by this particular Herod. What happens to Herod? Well, the Bible says there that he gave a speech as he was giving this oration. The people said, this is the voice of a God and not a man. Of course, they were trying to butter him up. They were trying to sue for peace. Uh, they wanted good relations because uh, Herod's country supplied them with uh, needful things. So they were trying to butter him up. But he didn't give glory to God, and he knew better. So the Bible says he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now, it doesn't say it the other way around. It doesn't say he died, and then he was eaten of worms. It said he, he was eaten of worms and then gave up the ghost. So some people speculate that he died of having worms. I don't know if you've ever had a dog that had worms or anything like that, but it's a terrible thing. And some people speculate that that's how he died, but he wasn't. A very savory character. And as we look at the Herods, that's sort of the impression we get that they're really not very good people. So we come to Herod Agrippa. Now Herod and his sister Bernice uh, were there to hear uh, from the Apostle Paul. And of course, as they enter into the scene, the Bible tells us that he came in with great pomp. When uh, Agrippa entered into the room when he came into the room it says on the morrow when Agrippa was come and Bernice with great pomp they entered into the place of hearing now again just like the other Herod that was eaten of worms uh, they welcomed him with great pomp and circumstance they said this is the voice of a god not a man they tried to butter him up it seems like they had this great interest in pomp and circumstance and for the uh, peasantry and all their underlings to constantly be lauding praise on them. And we really don't see that the situation has changed any here with Agrippa and Bernice. And of course, there is a lot of uh, suspicion about uh, Agrippa's relationship to Bernice, even though, they, uh, even though they were brother and sister. Some people speculate that they might have, might have had an incestuous relationship that's sort of the suspicion. But she's there, and she's with him, and that's the man that Paul is appearing before, a young man. But, as we're going to see, he was acquainted with the customs of the Jews. Uh, we, be, we begin there in Acts chapter 26, verse 1. It says, Paul stretched forth his hand and answered him. Now, we don't know a whole lot about public speaking in the New Testament. We don't know if they did it with a lot of gesticulations and motions and things, but this is one of those cases where the Bible says that Paul uh, stretched forth his hand, he motioned to them. Uh, we get to see a little bit of that in the scriptures from time to time. You know, some people speak, when they speak, they speak bold upright with constant eye contact with their audience. Other people, when they speak, they gesticulate a lot, and they walk around, and their speaking is more dramatic. Uh, Paul, we get to see very little of what he did, but in this particular time, he made a motion. And then he goes on there in Acts chapter 26, verse 2, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer myself uh, this day before thee, touching the things I am accused of by the Jews especially because I know thee to be an expert in all the customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Because he was the king of the Jews, because he was of that line of Herod the Great, and they were a ruling family in that part of the world, he knew about the customs of the Jews. Uh, he was also um, uh, sort of a, uh, a custodian of, of things Jewish, um, he was uh, um, sort of the, the caretaker. He was in charge of appointing uh, the high priest. Uh, some people say that he was also the uh, custodian of the priestly vestments that were, um, that were occupied uh, not by the, the Jews but by the state. And uh, some people say that, you know, that was part of his situation. Um, but anyhow, since he was the uh, governor of that part of the world, 
uh, Paul is making his case to him. He says, I'm glad to make my case because he knew that he would be familiar with the customs of the Jews. So Paul makes that statement. Um, and in verse 4 he says, My manner of life from my youth, which I which uh, was at first among my own nation at Israel, and, and uh, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, that they would testify that after the most strict, straightest sect of our religion, I live a Pharisee. So Paul is talking about his lifestyle in Judaism, and that all the people could testify, all the Jews that would, would make accusations against him could testify uh, about his circumstances. Um, he says in the New International Version, they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And so he says, I'm not an unknown person to these people making accusations against me. In verse 6, he says, and now it is because of my hope of what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night, O King. It is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? So he goes back to a familiar theme. He appeals to his personal history as a Pharisee and believing all the things that the Pharisees believed. And among these things that the Pharisees believe in is the resurrection of the dead. So he goes back to this. We've seen Paul do this before, and I think this is important. Because really, the whole message of the gospel, as we look in the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, the beginning of that chapter, it defines the gospel. And that's the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So... It should not be unusual <coughs> for us to see Paul going back to this idea of the resurrection. He, he keeps going back to this idea. He keeps saying time and time again that I am on trial. I am being accused because of my hope in the resurrection. And again, that's the centerpiece of the gospel, and that's what Paul has communicated uh, each one of these times where he's been on trial and had to talk before people, he talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the hope of the gospel. And this is re his recurring theme, and we see that all the way from Paul's journey from Jerusalem to Rome. So we're going to close there tonight, and uh, we're going to pick up there next week in Acts chapter uh, 26, verse 9. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for the hope of the gospel, the good news about a Savior who came and died in our place and was raised again to live eternally and was gone to prepare a place for us in heaven. Father, we thank you for the wonderful hope of the gospel. We pray that you would give us boldness to proclaim this truth and this hope to a lost and dying world. We thank you most of all for Jesus. And it's in his most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.